Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for your mercy and your love and your forgiveness. Thank you for this message that you have provided for us, for your present truth and for your guidance in all that we do. We pray that you'll be with us today as we gather to hear what we what is presented for us today and we pray that we will write it upon our hearts and our minds and understand it and use it in um according to your will and as you guide us in these last days we pray in the name of your son jesus christ amen amen thank you um Okay, my, um, my presentation today is part two of uh, the APIS Bull Understanding God, and it was presented by Elder Parminder. It was um, LGC, Grand Cree. It was October 15th of, this, of last year. And just for those who, I did part one, like at the very beginning of this uh, year, I think it was the first Sabbath. Um, so uh, I put the wrong date that he gave it. I put the date. So if anybody has the notes or cares, the part one was done on the 14th of October. And this is part two done on the 15th of October. I, I put the the date of the when they uploaded it to YouTube. So I messed up. So I want to make that correction. Um, because and I'm not sure how I can do it otherwise if people get notes off the the website because they'll never find it on the date October 25th. So that was my bad, but I wanted to make that correction. And so, um, wedding ring. Okay, I'm just looking at the chat. And um, anyways, um, said wedding ring, and I didn't know what that meant. So um, this is part two, and. Um, yeah, okay, the notes are there. I just don't know how to make the correction, somehow figure out how to make the date correction. Um, part two is, I, I, I really don't need to do a review of part one and you'll find out when we get to part two. Um, but we've been hearing lots of reference to the Apis Bull. Uh, was it, well, maybe it's, we haven't, anyways, in, in this last week in something I was listening to online. There, I think it was uploaded, Elaine, on those dates because on the, on the date of the video, it definitely said that the part two was done on the 15th. So, um, Anyway, something that was done live this week mentioned the Apis Bull. The Apis Bull's just all over the place. And um, it's something I think we'll hear more about in the future. Uh, just basically because of a remark uh, in this part two, um, we're not done with the Apis Bull. So I'm going to screen share here. So um can have something else to look at then okay so i have it open okay you'll have to forgive me i have to, i'm gonna have to go here first and then excuse this here but here we go. 
this is where I want to be and I want to get everything out of the way. So I want to present from the Okay. <clears throat> there it goes. Okay, so this is part two. We don't see your notes. If we're Sharing is pause. Bring your shared window to the front. Okay. We're seeing your WhatsApp. I'm sorry. Well, don't, don't read it. <laughs> or, or whatever. That's it's my gone. personal thing. With but it says sharing happening. is pause. Bring your. Stop share. How do I bring my window to the front? Because I had it open. I had the, the, um, I don't know on a Mac. I just I have the to, screen and you select the file. You should already have the file. I, I had it open and I had it. And then, but when I opened up the screen share, it wasn't there. It was, Okay, it was, it was my, it was, okay, so. Sometimes you have I, to go back to the document, make sure the document is, like if I have multiple internet windows open, if you have it in Google Docs, that might be part of it. Um, if you had a different window open, but you have multiple tabs open, it's gonna go to the tab you have open. So go back to where you, if you're, if you're on Google Docs, if that's where you're reading it from, then then go to that tab and then go to share screen and, and it should be there. Yeah, well, it was. I was on that tab, and then so, and I had put it on that, and to get it, because when I opened it up, uh, my screen was showing the signal and not. Uh, well, that was nothing. Anything. My my son's just sharing how. Um, yeah, it was a good article. I read that one. That's something about you. Have you read it? Yeah, it was a good article. Okay, I guess he says it's a little bi he not biased was his word, but um, misleading was his word. So I don't know, but he said, but here it is because I asked him what he was talking about, and that. So let's go here and see if this happens again. Now I'm gonna, but I'm gonna go back over here. I'm gonna share my screen. And see, it still comes. Oh, here it is. Okay, here we go. Now, do you see it? Yeah, it's not. Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, we'll just. And it's going now. All right. So, LGC October 15, 2020, part two. Yes. So, it begins like this. I got a very interesting question yesterday. It was an extra one because if you remember, and I'm sure you probably don't, but he said he was going to answer two questions. He had eight presentations during the, that, that camp meeting, and he was going to answer two questions. One was on First John 420, is that right? And the other question was on homeschooling. Um, and so he was just gonna answer those two questions throughout the course of his eight presentations. But he got a very interesting question after he did part one. And it's an extra question that was not on his list and he was wanted to answer it, that question first today. So it will be his the third question that he's going to deal with. And the question was the following. In yesterday's presentation, what was I talking about? So he says, I obviously failed yesterday because the questioner had no idea what I was referring to. Hang on, let me get this. I would ask, but I already know the answer. How many of you watched soap operas, TV series? Uh, these drama shows that go on every week, on and on, never ending. 
obviously everyone's good here and they don't watch them. But if you did, then you would know that the way they keep your interest in these TV shows is by dealing with lots of little pieces of information. Something might happen to someone one week, the story doesn't end. It just closes on that issue and it could be weeks before an explanation is given to what happened on that issue that you saw recently. That's how these studies work. I, I sometimes jump back in time. Um, so I received, so he repeats, I received, so let me go back. I, he repeats, I received a question yesterday. The question asked what I was talking about. It didn't seem to make sense or it was directionless. So I tried to give an analogy of what I'm doing. So his analogy is over here that he sometimes jumps around. He doesn't always complete the thought. And uh, he'll explain a little bit more about it. Unlike Elder Tess's studies, my studies wander or meander over a long extended period of time. I may mention a subject and then leave it for weeks. Sometimes I might pick that subject up 12 or 18 months later. <laughs> like my brain won't remember that if it's been 12 or 18 months. Anyways, I've gone beyond apologizing for this methodology. I guess everybody just goes in the direction that I go, but I have warned people of this issue many times in the past. If you miss presentation or cat meetings in the future, when I mention an issue, it may not make sense. So basically what he's gonna do is repeat or review, revise the first study. So yesterday's or part one was a continuation of a study that was done in October um, of 2020 on October 10. And it was a question and answer session on relationships. What distracted or threw people in that study was that I switched from pure relationship counseling to parabolic teaching. I felt I needed to do that in order to set the stage to answer some questions. Yesterday's or part one's presentation was a recap of what I had done in the previous October 10th presentation. That was an introductory thought to a future question. We spoke about the apis bull in part one, and I wanted to make a few points. Some of the study was based upon a presentation that Elder Tess did, I think on the 16th of May, 2020. What she did in her first presentation yesterday was e reiterate that May 2020 study. She rephrased it, or I want to say repackaged or formalized what she had said in May of 2020. I'm not saying this was the formalization of the message. That's not the point I'm making. The point that she made in May and she reiterated yesterday in her own words, paraphrased. In May, it was the form and the character. And we should be familiar with that, those terms, the form and, char and character. So in May, it was the form and the character. If you want to represent God by someone who has a lot of strength and you call him Hercules or Achilles, whoops, bad punctuation there, and that needs fixed. You wouldn't represent that person in the form as a skinny man. It would be a well-built muscular person. Then you would give him certain characteristics, a personality. I think people 
understand that you match the character with the form. In yesterday's presentation, Elder Tess used two words, form and spirit, which are the same as form and character. The way she expressed herself was she took the history of 2019, which was, you know, it's not, it wasn't last year, but two years ago. She took the history from 2019 where the form was wearing trousers and laying hands on women. It was a form. People objected. People objected when they were told to obey the form because they felt it was not sufficient. It was not a true religious experience. The reason they think that incorrectly is because they don't understand how parable teaching works. If you go back to the story of Exodus, because we were discussing um, the story of Aaron and the golden calf in part one. If you go back to the story of Exodus, it's not the spirit that's important it's the form that's important. We shall, we should all acknowledge and recognize that. Okay, so what was important in Exodus was the form. And this is a representation of the form. I have lots of different representations throughout the presentation. Where did this form come from? Whose idea was it? I'll give you a choice. Satan or the people? Yeah. Now I'm going, to, I got a wrong answer here. I wish I could see if there was anybody answering in the chat. Um, and it, well, you're reading ahead anyways. So anyway, um, There you go, messing around with stuff. And so Satan or the people? Uh, now I'm going to give an answer. Someone says, people, people. I tricked you all because I was not speaking about the golden calf. Like we're mind readers. I was talking about the cloud, the fire. God invented this system. The people just copied it. So can you see what he's saying? Okay, anybody there? Am I on mute? No, I can hear you. So, yeah. so when, he's going can hear you. To, when he's going to the story of Exodus, that's where he's referring to and our minds go to the calf, but he was talking about the clouds. Did I follow that right? The cloud and the fire. Well, it, it, not, it's not exactly because we didn't know he was, you know, he just, we yeah. can't read his mind. Yeah. But um, the, the, the who invented the system, the okay. system who invented this idea of making a golden calf was not invented by the people or Satan. It was invented by God. Okay, got it. Thank you. And why can he say that? Because of the cloud and because of the fire. Why did God not tell them just believe in the spirit? Why did he give them a physical representation of himself? That being the the pillar of cloud well with the, anyway the cloud by day and the fire by night those were form. physical they were a form right okay. and it god did the form so we got to start twisting our thinking here because god is the one who came up with representing himself physical in a physical form but that's because that's how parables work. You go from the natural to the spiritual, the literal to the spiritual. 
The people did not invent this evil. They got it from God. God represents himself as a cloud, as fire. This is not an unusual thing to make a calf. Okay, that's... Last year, when we said worship God in the form, and many of you objected to that, I want you to see the wisdom in that policy. And that's worshiping him in the form was putting on for, in the American language, pants. In the European language, trousers. And um, that was a form because you all needed that form. Now, Elder Tess has said we need to move away from the form and go to the spirit or the character. Many people are now struggling with the spirit. That was one point that I wanted to bring out yesterday or in part one. What was this thing? Another point that I wanted to bring out was the issue of leadership. Most of us have no idea what good leadership looks like. Why? Is there something wrong with us? You? Are we blind? Some people would say yes. I wouldn't. Parminder would not say yes. I would say the problem is if you just had a leader on their own, you would not know if they're good or bad. What do you have to do with that leader? To answer your question, you have to compare them to something else. Well, I don't know, that doesn't sound right. And I'm thought I rechecked this but to answer the question you have to compare them with something else wrapped in the story of the golden calf the apis bull is the issue of leadership a crisis is going to be created itself based upon the true and the false the cloud and the cow so two forms one true one false in this crisis, there will be an opportunity to, de to decide what is good and bad leadership, Aaron or Moses. Last year, this movement, or FFA, that was the form. Today, it's the spirit. Then we compared the Alpha of ancient Israel with the Omega of ancient Israel. I know it's kind of hard to see it in there. How did we make the link? Does anybody remember? I'm putting my hand over it. <laughs> I can't see. How we made the link between the Alpha of ancient Israel and the Omega of ancient Israel last time. It's been a month, I know. What was the link between the Alpha and the Omega? A separate point, so he's going outside here. The form in 2019 was trousers. I would already pointed that out. In the Alpha of ancient Israel, it was the golden calf. We connected the two histories with the number 3000. And so before I click to the next point, does any can anybody tell me? And it can't be Elaine. <laughs> I don't know the answer. I don't remember. Um, so. <laughs> you don't remember the connect the two histories with the number three thousand. Was it Moses um, when God struck the three thousand um, in the wilderness, and then also in Acts when the three thousand were saved um, when Peter preached. Okay. 3,000 were saved. Did you put that in too? Okay. That's the beginning of it, but there's something about how were these 3,000 referred to? Um, 
that, that this is a progression. Oh, think, yeah. think progression. Okay, my yeah. husband, my husband who can't turn on his audio or will Troy got bless it. you out. Did somebody do it? Somebody Troy. answer Yeah, Troy it? has it that they were meaning male and female. In, in, right, we had the female or the male, and then in later it was the male and the female. Right, we had very right. good. Right. Thank right. you. Yeah, so I just I know sometimes it's hard, but whenever yeah. there's something I get and I can ask a question, and I think we'll and then the, um, that just had to do with the trousers and the the forms here, the two forms. Then I made another point that not only do we compare and contrast, we have progression. What was the progressive idea or concept that we saw? It starts with 3,000 something, ends with 3,000 3, something. There's 3,000 men, then 3,000 souls, which we understand to be men and women. Um, so starts with men, ends with men and women. I think I have one more. There are many themes, many ideas that we can develop from the Apis Bull study. We ended with this thought. If you do a simple study on the Apis Bull, you'll see that this bull is obviously a representation of God. Now, is this one God or many gods? This is a simple but also complex question. And I want to apologize if you don't look too close. I didn't realize that this is actually a bull, but it's supposed to be a cow. I didn't see the horns till it was too late. I'm, so pretend this is a cow. Now remember the bull had a mother. Here's the mom. To make a special bull, you have to have a special mother. She has horns. So she's going to be impregnated by the spirit. The spirit is light and the light is lightning. She's impregnated, virgin conception. She has a virgin birth and never produces again. You have to remember that this bull is real. It's a real bull in real life. This is clever propaganda or PR work. They get the bull and take it to Memphis. And I forgot to mention the last time I did this, this study is um, there were special characteristics of the, um, the cow. No, the bull. There, so they, they had like a list of, and I wish I would have refreshed myself, I forgot until now, of characteristics that the apis bull had to possess to be considered the apis bull. One thing I remember is under its tongue, it had to have a scarab shape under its tongue. I think it had to have wing-like uh, markings on its back. The forehead had to have special markings. It, can anybody think of other um, characteristics the Apis bull was supposed to have? No, nothing coming up in the chat. Okay. Yeah, I can't. Oh, my husband said something about the tail, and then maybe he's right. But anyway, there's a whole list. Well, obviously you're not going to find one of these bulls. If they found one or two characteristics, that was the bull, that was the apis bull. So, um, so they take it to Memphis, which is, you know, Mecca for them. And it, the problem is, it's a real bull and it's going to die. But how can it die? Because this is God. So you can see now this is getting more complex, this pagan religion. How, how are they going to handle this dying thing? They have to represent this bull that dies in different ways. It cannot just be a normal god. 
God controls life and death. This bull must represent not only the God of life, it must represent the God of death. We have Tar, the god of life, and Osiris, the god of death. Another way to express it is Osiris is the god of the underworld or hell. They would combine all these ideas of God into a single entity, a small animal that then becomes a big phenomenon. So you can see, and I think it's going to be in what he says here, why Aaron says, I'm just going to go to where I don't want to, where Aaron says, okay, oh, we'll wait. So we've identified three characteristics, and this was in the previous um, presentation, but what three characteristics can you remember? Um, for this bull, this this god, what what three characteristics do you, anybody recall? One of the characteristics is a warrior, courage, warrior. Right, courage. fighting spirit, strength, fighting spirit, courage. and strength, strength and fighting spirit. Right, these were the three that were identified. Um, I believe these are what this is what tests. Um, identified, but Parminder wants to identify a fourth. And do you recall from part one what the fourth characteristic of this bull Fertil dog? Fer this fertility. Oh, yeah. Fertility. You got it. Fertility. So Elder Tess has focused on the first three. These are all characteristics of a king or a pharaoh. Remember that there's this cow that's going to give birth to this king. This idea of new life is incorporated into the image of a bull. It's a living bull, so it will die. What will the priest do when it dies? They'll search through Egypt and find a new one. You don't have, and it's really hard, we don't speak in written language, so it's very difficult at times to transcribe our speaking. You don't have just life, you have the renewal of life. We will call it the cycle of life. You start as a baby, you as a youth, and that's how he said it, you get old, you die, and then you repeat the cycle. In order to renew life, you have to have fertility. So that's why he threw in the fourth, because we have to renew life, because this is not an immortal object. The concept of fertility begins to be incorporated in the imagery of the bull. Okay, when we were in Exodus 32, verse 5, it says the following, and we're just going to read the last part of verse 5. Aaron says, tomorrow is the feast to the Lord. And out of the verse now to God. They're going to have a feast tomorrow and they're going to worship Jehovah. This is the one true God. Even though, even though it's the one true God, yet Aaron says these are the gods, plural, that led you out of Egypt. Verses one and four. Whether you see it as multiple gods or a god who is multifaceted for the purpose, or, or, or a god who's multifaceted, I should have a period there, 
For the purpose of this study, you can interchange these two ideas. Have you ever noticed you like go over and over something and then you still find mistakes? We always see it more when we present. <laughs> I know I do. And I thought I, I, I can, mean. I can go over mine 10 times and each time there's a mistake. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's like, oh my word. Anyways, everybody, you all understand. So uh, here we see why, you know, and I always wondered, I have to be honest, is why he's, he's, Aaron said this. These are the gods that led you out of Egypt. I, I never got it actually to this study, you know, because this god, this apis bull, this golden calf, had to have so many characteristics, you know, it, 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 like it says, it could be multiple gods or God with multifaceted, um, uh, who is multifaceted, but it, it, we're gonna interchange the two ideas. And I, I understand something, it's amazing. I'm actually getting something, some, uh, this is not an argument against multiple gods. Um, they know it's Jehovah, one God, but you can equally say it's many gods. This bull is how many gods? As we have it on the board. Now, the answer's there, but... It's this, this bull is just two gods, a war god and a god of love. So two gods. I found that interesting too. Um, just two gods. Uh, verse six says they rise up early in the morning. We'll read. They rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought, brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. This playing was not a game of football. This was the act of intimacy or open sex. If you go to Genesis chapter 26, verse eight, this is a story about Isaac, Rebecca and the Philistines. Hang on. <clears throat> I tried to take a sip of water <clears throat> so you guys wouldn't know, and then I choked on it. So this is um, Genesis 26, 8 is about Isaac, Rebecca, and the Philistines, or the Philistines. In the last part of the verse, it says, Behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebecca, his wife. <clears throat> that word sporting in Genesis 26 is the same word as play in Exodus 32. And I'm a person that has to look those up and I have, now, I have completely neglected looking up and verifying that he's telling the truth. Has anybody looked it up? It's not that I don't, you know, I, I, you want to trust these guys, but I don't, I trust them to a certain point. My husband said he did months ago. So when this first came out and Genesis 26, Isaac is not playing tag or chase with his wife. He's flirting with her. It's sexual interplay between them. And that's what's happening in Exodus 33. In mass, the people are all flirting with one another. And what I'm saying they're doing is a religious experience. This is not, as I called it yesterday, just a plain orgy or open sex. This is a religious experience and we must see it that way. So I need help if I can ask the question is it as far as a religious experience because because i'm having a hard time you know thinking of you know having sex 
being a religious experience. And I know it relates to, it has to relate to fertility. I think they're bringing in that pagan um, uh, ritual mindset that they have been brought up with, with in uh, Egypt because that's what they used to oh. do. So they still are carrying oh, okay. that, you know. Okay, okay, that, that helps. Temple prostitutes and things of that sort. That was a real ritual. That was a religious ritual and it, it did include sex. Right. Well, I mean, because, you know, I read about the temple prostitutes and not, I never understood another thing I learned through this study. It's what still were, a thing what too. Were, well, explain. Go further, Adriana. What, um, I think in India, there's a religion where they still have female, and it's a lot of times it's like young underage girls, but child, child temple okay. prostitutes or just temple okay. prostitutes it's, it's still a thing that happens so people will come in and um intercourse as part of a worship process okay that's that's <laughs> more than okay so that's it's not okay because i'm thinking you were meaning it was a christian thing but it's still there's still religious practices out there you're saying where yeah. there is going on and and it's underage girls that makes me so sad yeah well um, it happens well, a lot in certain areas where there's a lot of poverty because they don't have food to eat so they resort to happens in africa too from what i know but in the one i'm talking about in india specifically for religious reasons um yeah yeah interesting i mean um, but okay the sex that have come out of different christian places with those uh like cultish type places they end up doing that also kind of in a weird way so i don't know why but it's still likes to to pop up every now and then it's widespread yeah, yeah. it's widespread in cults and i think one of the reasons why they use that form of worship with, with sex whatever orgies whatever is because it's the most intense human experience that human beings can experience and so I think they use that and take it to another level. Right. Control. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I just this this is gives me. Uh, was it Donna that said about the um, that back that they just were carrying it over, the Jews were carrying it over from their their. Um, Exodus and Babylonian experiences, where but by Babylon time, well, I don't know who was I was listening to. The idols were gone. You know there were no Aphis bulls anymore, but they still were doing the. I guess it would be the spirit of the, of the. Um, and from what I understand, with them. Um, Elder Parmender, you know, they were very visual and experiential people. That's why God had to come uh, in a cloud and fire by night and cloud by day. They had to see that visual thing and they had to experience this. And so in that dispensation, they needed these things, you know, and so that yeah. physical, physical cow, the mm. physical statue cow, whatever bull, they had to have this, they had to see that. Whereas in compare and contrast to our dispensation, we don't have to see that. That's right. That's not our, yeah. yeah. Part of why <laughs> we, we don't, don't have, have to, to see. Sorry, part of why we don't have to see it, I think is because it's written. Isn't that why all these things are written as end samples for you? So it had to happen in their history so that we could have an example of it now. So we don't need it now because we know it happened. You know what I'm saying? Is that confusing? No, that, that makes sense. No, that's, I, that makes sense, but it, it also, yeah. that totally makes sense. But it also could be that we are living in a dispensation um, where we see things spiritually now and um, with parable uh, teaching is mainly looking at things spiritually. 
We don't have to have that phys well, physical yeah. manifestation of an apis bull when we see God now, you know? We can experience, ex we can experience that spiritually in his character and our character. So I think yeah. spiritual has a lot to do with it for our dispensation. And, and, and one other thing, well, the one thing I struggle with, go back, is just the, um, still struggling with the fertility aspect as far as the nature of God. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, well, but I, I, yes, I totally, I, I, I understand that before even Christ, they had many pagan religions and most of these pagan religions had a triune relationship with a, it had a Godhead, it had a female. Um, there's always had some sort of female God in there with a baby or a child. And um, so I think that might be where that came from because we know that um, Horus and what was that female god, the Egyptian female god, starts with an H. Oh gosh, I forget. Yeah. Anyway. I'm not going to accept it. Anyway, the female goddess was a big thing in pagan, yeah. in all pagan religion, religions. Didn't God also tell his people go forth and multiply? So it could be a perversion of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so too. Also the creation, the creative power. Creative, okay. Uh, that's that's a good point there. Okay. And the Bible verse, I'm not sure. I'm just looking at the chat. What the Bible verse is. First Corinthians 15, 46. Oh, Ishtar, is that what the... I think it was H no, there you're yes, Hathor. Hathor. That was her name. Hathor. Hathor. The goddess. She was in all that Egyptian stuff. She was a big Egyptian goddess. Very important. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I, unfortunately, history was. I I paid as little attention in history as I could. It was not my favorite class. So that's why these history lessons I are difficult. <laughs> uh, I think for, she was the mother of Apis Bull. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I think she might have been the mother of Apis Bull. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so that that's kind of helped me because I just really like struggled with this fertility thing being a religious experience and it's something we should be getting understanding something from that if this is supposed to be a character of God because um, I mean I know it's their 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 earthly you know God but still it's not our God a God of courage and strength fighting spirit in a in a different sense than we think fighting spirit because he's fighting you know to to save us um but anyways i appreciate that dialogue um we'll go on here uh the point that i want us to see on the issue of the golden cap or apis bull was not the issue of the warrior king that's the point that elder Tess brought up she compared that king in 1 Samuel 8, 4. She compared that to King Saul. I said Samuel. <laughs> oh, it does say. <laughs> Hang on. I'm starting that sentence over. She compared that to King Saul in 1 Samuel 8, 4. This calf was the God that led them out of Egypt and would do what? lead them back in the same way. Saul was that same being that would lead them. Again, an interesting something I never contemplated when they were wanting a king was that they wanted that king to lead them back into Egypt or Babylon or 
Yeah, that, it's just interesting. Now, when you do a study of the Apis bull, the bull does not start off being God. It starts off being his agent, his spokesperson. We would call it the messenger of the Lord. By and by, over time, as time progresses, this messenger of God becomes more and more powerful and turns into a God. When you go to the Exodus story, when you go to uh, oh, okay. When you go to the Exodus story, is the cloud God or is it the messenger of God? I remember reading when God speaks to the people, he says, my angel will lead you. So is the cloud the messenger of God? People are saying it's the messenger of God. And I'm yeah, I'm sure we all know that it is actually Jesus. Sometimes Jesus is a cloud pretending he's a messenger. Then he changes his clothes, goes on the mountain and shouts and pretends to be another God or the boss of the cloud. And you think the Egyptians have a hard time. <laughs> I mean, like I said, this is much better as a spoken, you know, presentation, this is part of it because, you know, he's, he's being, uh, he's using uh, some very visual, um, visual things here. And, and I, I don't know, to me, it's like almost apostasy, you know, to say that Jesus pretends he's the messenger and then he goes and changes his clothes and shouts from the mountain and pretends to be another god and it's like blasphemy, but um, he's just trying to show us how what, what difference is Christianity from these pagan religions. But not much different when you think about what you're visually seeing and, and, and doing. So this bull grows in its stature over time. Now the point that I want us to see in this study is that you have this issue of fertility. In this spirit world, you have the lightning and the immaculate conception. Is that the literal or the spiritual? I'm going to say it's spiritual because what's the literal? And give me a Bible verse for the literal. Someone said Exodus 32.8. Remember, Sister Debbie, I, and I had to put it in like that. Um, I guess I could left that. We're talking about a sexual act between what and what. In the spiritual, it's between a cow and lightning. So that's the spiritual. Um, I'm not sure what Exodus 38, 32, 8 reads. Uh, Maybe somebody, could somebody read that just so we can kind of get some context to what he's saying there, anybody? Okay. It's okay, I'll find my- Yeah, I'll read it. That's just okay, go seat. ahead. <clears throat> that, just that one verse? Just verse eight. Yeah, I just okay. want to see what it says. Just 30, 32, eight. They have turned yeah. aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshiped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, these, <clears throat> these be thy gods, O Israel. 
which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Okay, okay, I see. So they were, um, he was asking for a, a Bible verse for the spiritual. And someone said that, but that was, that was a literal, it was, it was Debbie, but we don't wanna. So uh, anyway, uh, what's going on, thank you. What, what's the literal, Exodus 32, six, it says, so that's, Two verses before that, and we it, it goes into it a little bit. They rose up to do what? To do what the apis bull's mother did, which is what? To play. So this sexual act that they're doing is a literal representation of the spiritual. Exodus 32 verse six. They play, they have intimacy with each other. This is a literal representation of the spiritual. The spiritual was the mother cow and the lightning, as we have depicted. This calf, the apis bull, is the miraculous birth. So this, the spiritual is the lightning and the cow, and the literal is the actual uh, sexual act. The point I want us to see is that when we start looking at either idolatry or Christianity, it's all based upon this modeling, whether we look at the true or the counterfeit. Will you get the same answer? Will you get the same answer if you look at idolatry? Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry, true or the counterfeit. Did I read it all wrong? Whether you look at the true or the counterfeit, will you get the same answer? Will you get the same answer if you look at idolatry or Christianity? Good. I got a couple of yeses. I agree. Which is the easiest one to examine or to investigate? And what have we always been told as Adventists? And didn't everybody get the story about that new bank teller and how that bank teller in training only looked at counterfeit bills? Only looked at the true bills. Only looked at the true bills, excuse me only looked at the true bills so that they would be able then to, to, to spot the counterfeit. Did everybody get, I mean, I got that story. I, I thought it, it's assumed that every Advent has heard that story. But Parminder, of course, has a different take. He would suggest the counterfeit was the easy one to investigate. You can begin to see why much of conservative Christianity is so ugly. You have this poor cow and what's going to happen to it? You're going to get this lightning and come and do its thing with this cow. Who's in charge? Who's in control? It's not the cow, is it? So you begin to see, hopefully, that the whole model that we call Christian headship is being modeled in these idolatrous services or stories. So if we think this is ugly, crazy, what we want to see is that this is the counterfeit representation of the true. If the counterfeit is ugly, the true is ugly. I start thinking about that one now. He's talking about the counterfeit conception as ugly. So therefore the true is ugly. And what we 
what I want us to see is that all this idolatrous imagery, imagery is modeling fallen human relationships. When we see it in idolatrous services, we can recognize the ugliness. Yet when we bring the same issue, the relationship between two human beings, we seem to think that modeling is beautiful, good, and lovely. But I would suggest that it's not. So that brought another question to my mind, and I know this is kind of, you know, off limits type of stuff, but not with what Parmenter has been teaching about. But if, if what happens between two human beings is ugly, then what's it supposed to be like is my question. And, and I don't, I mean, uh, that's that's a something I or, or I'm misunderstanding how how he's wording it or why he's wording it, but um, you know we think of sex to be a beautiful, good and lovely thing, but he's suggesting that it's not, and and that and I don't understand. Egyptian idolatry is much more complex than just this apist bull. Whichever country you go to, whichever culture, whether it's the Babylonians, the Philistines, the Canaanites, the Egyptians, they are, they're all going to have the same stories, just different names. Dagon, does everybody know about Dagon? We'll pick up on Dagon in Judges 16.23. And it says there, then the lords of the Philistines gathered the, them together to offer a great <coughs> sacrifice unto their God. This is the God of the Philistines. And you probably all know that Dagon is a fish god. That means he's the God of the sea. So the question is, is the sea, the God of the sea a top God or a second rated God? It depends on one's perspective. What does the sea do? Anybody remember? Oh, we're not going there yet. I'll go back. Sorry, gotta go back again. I thought I, I didn't realize I had another. Okay, well, there we go. Didn't realize. You're a Philistine and the Philistines live on the coast, which means they're a coastal people. You're going to be this word that's repetitive because he's got interpreters who may not understand. So if it seems like he says something more than once, it's because the interpreter one or so interpreters doesn't get the words he says. So, so anyway, they, they live by the sea. You're going to be driven as, as a Philistine in your whole cultural experience by what phenomena? The sea. What will you see every day? The sea. <laughs> Just what I'd love to see every day. Who's the most important God? The sun. The sun is the most important God. Therefore, Dagon must be number two. But we go back to this question over here. What does the C do? When it's not one of those jet skis. Yeah, my, I made my husband laugh. What does the C do every day? I like that 
I put answer because somebody answered on the chat. The sea eats the sun every day. Now who's the more powerful one? The one who eats the sun or the sun? So you begin to see it's not about importance, like the sun being the most important. It's about the roles. You can keep on eating the sun and what will the sun do every day? It will not just come back, it will resurrect. Not sure what he means by that thought, but to me that's coming back. It's going to resurrect every day, a rebirth. Now, is the sun male or female? Let's get gross. What does the fish do? The sun enters into the fish. Is that graphic enough? Good. So the sun is the man and therefore Dagon is the female. You can go for image after image. He's just talking about describing this. So it's about the role they're playing. And the sun is a man in an, another story. So he's, he's going to another story where the sun is the man. If the sun is the man, the woman is the moon. This was a new model I was referring to, just so we all didn't get confused. The moon, this woman is standing in the glory of the man the sun. All I want us to see, if you think all of these ideologist practices are crazy, what's more crazy, to believe that men are the heads of women or to believe a fish god eats the sun? They are the same story. So again, something Kind of difficult for me to wrap my head around, but he keeps going. Now, I'm pretty sure that the Philistines of today no longer believe in fish gods. They've moved on. My question is, why have we not moved on? If you read Judges 16, you would laugh at these Philistines, but we don't laugh at ourselves. Let's conclude. We've been speaking about the apis bull and I've wanted to introduce a number of concepts or ideas connected to this bull. Some of them are relevant right now and some of them you need to put in a place because they're going to be brought up in the future. The main point I want us to see is that when you do a study on the apis bull, you see it's an idolatrous representation, counterfeit, of a Christian practice called headship. Like any normal person in the 21st century who would read about Dagon and throw it away, you have to ask yourself the question, why are you not approaching the subject of headship in the same way? And my answer is because the thought never came into my mind. And, but his answer is, we are not reading inspiration uniformly. We pick and choose which bits we like and which bits we don't like. This is not a new point. This is a point that we, Elder Tess and myself, have been developing over a number of years. 
The problem is many of us are not connecting the dots, but we haven't been developing this over a number of years. We're not connecting the dots, particularly in the studies that Parminder, Elder Parminder has done over the years. So when I come to a study like this and I compare the bull with headship, people get agitated. You find it a shock. And somebody was mentioning, was it last night that, or sometime this week that they were going over the old 2520 uh, that Parminder did years ago. And they were just saying, it's all there. Everything he's saying now it's true, right here he says, I've been saying this for years um, and we didn't hear it, we didn't get it. My, my excuse as someone who's been in this movement since around 2005 is I lived in America. I didn't even know there was a Parminder buyant on the planet and it wasn't until about 2015 and that that's when he came back into the movement after his exile for time setting um and once i heard him then i i knew this as was the guy i needed to listen to but still i'm, I'm just giving my testimony i still live in america and Jeff Pippinger, that's who you're listening to. You know, you're, you're rarely hearing Parminder unless it's a camp meeting, because number one, you don't know anything about the Midnight Cry web, you know, Aronson's website with all these presentations. We, we just didn't know about them. Jeff's not up there promoting any of that stuff. So, so my excuse, as someone being in the movement for a long time, we just never heard of Parminder. Those that came in later, Parminder was a more prominent name and you're not connecting the dots because you weren't even around to find the dots. So, um, you know, that, that's just my excuse. Um, but um, I have a story, but I won't waste our time because we haven't had our lunch yet because lunch time is during, during worship hour. Um, so people get agitated and are shocked. Now, I could just say we believe in equality. Let's get rid of headship and that's the end of the story. But I wanted us to see through this story. You can do it through the story of a king. Now, this is not just a king. This is a warrior king. For those who are willing to see it, this is Deuteronomy 22.5. Women are not meant to fight. It's only men of war, men who are over 20 that go to battle. Women stay at home. So whether you tackle it with respect to the warrior or fertility, you see it's a repeat and enlarge, the same story. Men fight, women don't. That's Deuteronomy. That's what Deuteronomy 22.5 says. We know, hang on, I can't. We know that at the end of the world, everyone is required to fight the good fight. We call it the gospel, just like the 3,000 that were baptized at Pentecost. They were men and women. Today, those who put on the gospel armor, who become warriors, you might call them the 144,000. These are men and women. The spirit is equality, the form a woman shall wear men's clothing. You can call it trousers. I don't think, no, okay. 
um, you can call it trousers. So whether you use this model king or the model of fertility, you see that both stories teach the same thing. Women are not warriors and men impregnate women like the lightning. All of these models are showing us something about our own experience, which is wrong. The doctrine of headship, this is a woman, by the way. The doctrine of headship is no longer fit for purpose. It hasn't been for a long time. It's only recently that we have begun to develop the prophetic tools to demonstrate this. Most of what you believe, many of the decisions that you are making, the lifestyle choices are all based upon this modeling that men come before women. We should know that that is wrong. Let us pray. If you just bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for your long suffering with us, Lord. We thank you for knowing, knowing our minds and knowing that we need visual representations, Lord, but things got perverted. And um, here we are at the end of the world and we're pretty messed up in our thinking and understanding and our way of studying, Lord, because to be honest, like I've said throughout this presentation, these things never entered my mind. And, um, but things that were questions that I had have been answered. But here we are, we need to, we need to understand inspiration correctly and consistent, be consistent in our understanding. So I just ask that you would help us take from the study of the Apis Bull um, an understanding that we don't understand and that you would help us to understand and to make have it make sense, Lord, um, so that we're ready and able to to give the message um, that is yet to be formalized, Lord, but um, we need to be ready to give it. So help us. I, I'm just pleading. I'm, I can't even pray because I don't even know how. Um, I guess I feel so lost in this whole thing. But I just pray by your grace, you know that we're all but dust. And so thank you for your mercy and grace. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.